So let me switch up here. Um, I'm not going to spend a whole long, a lot of time up front because today's pretty simple. I'm going to give you the overview of where we've gone over the last five weeks. And you have homework to do, uh, which you can do actually starting now if you really want. Because you have a little piece of paper uh, in your bulletin that looks, as, well, looks something like this without the thing ripped out of it. It looks like this. What's your BHAG? Big, hairy, audacious goal for crosswalk. In the early service, we had a whole stack of people um, write stuff out, not just what they think uh, God might be calling them to do in their own life, things that require God to make happen, but we have been asking you for a couple weeks to be praying, what could the Spirit be stirring in Crosswalk to do? We already are pretty awesome, but God's doing, <laughs> just to brag about ourselves a little bit, uh, but we do a whole lot of stuff for the community here that's just incredible. And God has been reaching people that uh, never thought would come to church before, and they're here, and that's awesome. People that thought they were beyond redemption are here. Uh, it's awesome. Uh, we have 24 different recovery groups that call Crosswalk Home. That's awesome. This is the place that that should be happening. We feed a gazillion people uh, here locally and overseas through Crosswalk. It's just amazing. And we, there's no way we could do this stuff just on our own. So the Spirit of God's already been a part and with us in so many ways. What I'm asking you is, uh, what are some of those things that are bubbling in our midst, some dreams we might have uh, that would require God to really get them done? But something's stirring in our belly, something's been messing with us, we think, oh man, Crosswalk really should do that. And there's no way we could do it on our own. It totally requires God to be on the team. And we'll be like 1%, and God will be 99% if it's ever going to happen. But we really think that's what God uh, wants us to do. So that's the kind of thing I want you to be working on in this. And uh, what's going to happen, I'm going to give you an overview. You're going to hear from Bob Goff one more time, uh, which uh, he's just got a great uh, thing today that I wanted to share from uh, you from a TED Talk that he gave. And actually, you know, it strangely fits my whole kind of Christian thing because... You know, more than taking a stand and saying yes, just sort of in a binary way, what he's really recommending is what it looks like if we actually are Christian. What if we, what if we actually lived it? What might that look like? And so you're going to hear from him on that. After that, I'm going to invite you um, to listen to a song called Love Does, uh, which is motivated and inspired by uh, this book and, uh, and Bob Goff. And then uh, during that song and after that song, I'm going to invite you to come and... Uh, and set sail uh, your idea, your dream. What dreams might fly here today? And what you're going to do is you're going to come forward, and there's some tape uh, on the table here, and you're just going to tape your dream onto one of these balloons. And by the end of the service, when everybody's done, uh, this thing's going to come down quite a bit because it's going to be weighed down uh, by your dreams. Uh, but, uh, but it'll be a visual display of just what, what we might be dreaming of here and what God might be able to do. Very cool, by the way. I really appreciate Dar. We we're dreaming about ways. How, how could we do this? And I had a loser idea, and she way improved on it. <laughs> so, so this is really cool. There's one in the back. That was the one that was used from the first service, and I'm holding on to all these uh, from that service. So anyway, very, very cool um, what you get to do. So let me take you through where we've been very briefly. Uh, so on the next slide, uh, let me just walk you through these. Where love does has taken us. And the first thing it, we started with uh, was this statement, I'm with you. And the idea is that God is with us. And this is when Bob Goff told a story about this uh, young guy who got his GED and went over to his youth pastor's house and said, hey man, I'm leaving town. Um, just uh, got my GED, done with high school, and I'm just going to go to Yosemite and get a job and climb rocks. And the youth pastor recognized immediately that was a terrible idea. And instead of scolding him, said, hold on, let me grab a bag. And he went with him. And the whole time in there in Yosemite, uh, this kid has fallen flat on his face. It's not going well, but the youth pastor never got in his grill and said, boy, you're, you really must feel like an idiot now. He never did that. He just kept saying to Bob, I'm with you, Bob. I'm with you. And that Bob ended up being the Bob Goff because somebody was with him. And so I encourage you to write a thank you note that week to somebody who had been with you uh, and significantly impacted your life. Anybody do that, by the way? And was it a cool experience? All right, good job. For those of you who didn't, you can feel like a loser. That's okay. <laughs> the second week, uh, we talked about being free to fail. And, uh, and we talked about labels. Do you remember the label exercise we had? Uh, they're all over there uh, because a whole bunch of you on that day took my challenge to identify a label that you had embraced for yourself that was not really true of what, how God sees you. And uh, some of these are really um, heart-wrenching. Uh, so we have, uh, 
One's just called former. I gave the freebie. If anybody just wanted to be labeled by something generic, just write former down. So we got a few formers, but we have a person here who labeled themselves struggled with forgiveness. Another one labeled dysfunction. Another one they identify as, oh, I'm just a divorced person, and that's, that's all. There's nothing more to me. Another person said, uh, my name is Stuck, perfectionist and disappointment. Uh, another one here says, greedy with my time and comfort. Another one says, crazy psychotic. Wow. Another one says, uh, I identify as mean, like a mean person. Another one says, I identify as a failure, another person who's stuck. Or I'm not good enough. Uh, masked is another one. Selfish and fake. Abuser. Uh, another one here is another failure. I know there's one over here. Um, abused. Chameleon. Anorexic alcoholic. A liar. A black sheep of the family. Um, this is real stuff. You guys took it seriously. And the challenge was to recognize that that's not how God identifies us. And that one of the important steps we need to take is to let go of those labels and put them on the cross because that's where they belong and that's where they should stay. And instead we adopt a new label for ourselves. as a new creation in Christ. And we identify in God's love and God's hope for us. And a lot of you did that too. Beautiful. The third week, we talked about audacious love. And you remember this story? This is the kid uh, who wanted to propose to his girlfriend. And he goes to Bob Goff and basically asks him for the moon. <laughs> asks him if he can use his porch to have a dinner on. And asks Bob to cook it for him. Uh, asks if he could set up some speakers so he could dance with his girlfriend you know, right after dinner. Then asks him, do you have a sailboat, Bob? And Bob's like, sure. <laughs> and so he got Bob Goff to take him out in the sailboat where he could propose uh, while his friends were on beach saying, will you marry me, you know, in candlelight. I mean, it's really, really extraordinary. And Bob Goff kind of looked at that and said, I, I think that's kind of a picture of maybe how we should think of God interacting with us, that maybe all of creation, maybe in all of creation, uh, we can find God's love for us, expressions of God's love for us, if we'll just open our eyes and slow down to see it. Maybe all of life is filled with these special touches along the way where God is just dying for us to get the point. I love you, I love you, I love you. Will you follow me? Will you follow me? Will you follow me? So it's a whole different orientation to how we think about life because even in the painful times that we go through, God is there with us. And sometimes in those excruciating times, we're finally listening enough, we're finally looking enough and feeling enough and sensing enough to see that God was with us. That's why those times are so powerful in our lives. Well, then the next week we talked about not being afraid. And that had to do uh, with, uh, well, we had this idea of dead reckoning where we consider our gifts and we consider uh, God's direction in our lives and we kind of get an idea of where we're going. And you filled out a little piece of paper with a little compass on there. And there were some questions for you to fill out, like how are you uniquely gifted by God? What do those things look like? And what are things that really grab you about God's character? What's God really interested in that really pings your heart? And then we started to ask you the question, well, how could it be that uh, your uniqueness and what really pings you about God's character, how could those two things dovetail together to take you toward the meaningful life God has for you? And a lot of you took that exercise really seriously. Uh, I know that because I had your neighbor spy on you and tell me what you wrote down on that paper. <laughs> and last week we talked about uh, follow me. And what I tried to present to you is this is that the way of following me, and this is a little bit off Bob Goff and his, uh, his style, but I wanted to set a baseline for us. And the baseline was this, that life is tough. Life is not comfortable. Life is chaotic. No matter what, follow Jesus or not, life is chaotic. You're going to get curveballs thrown at you left and right from relationships, from job, from the weather. All kinds of things are going to come at you, and life is going to be a mess at times. It's just the way life is. And we can have a very messy life without God in it at all. But what we notice about every one of those people that said yes to God, and you can look, <laughs> you read the Bible, you're going to find out that the mess didn't go away. It just went in a different direction. It's just that the mess became very purposeful. And the craziness and the chaos uh, was more about just my little kingdom and started to be about something greater. So follow me. When we say yes to follow me, we're not saying that there's not going to be any chaos anymore, that we're going to be walking through a bed of roses. What we're really saying is, I know life's going to be a mess. I know it's going to be nuts. But I know it's going to be nuts on purpose. 
And I know that if it's going to be challenging, it's going to be challenged in a direction that's, that's going to deliver the goods of life to me because Jesus said, I came to give you life in, a, in abundance. And I know that the messes that I'm going to find myself in and following you, uh, they're going to lead to something really important. The world's going to get a little brighter. There's going to be a little bit more hope in the world, a little more love in the world because I chose to say yes to you. And then the invitation was simply uh, related to this cup. Uh, asking you to recognize uh, who God is in your life. Talk about uh, who you are and start talking about what are some goals that you'd be after. And my, my question for you to answer was, how might you pour yourself out for what God is asking you to do? Because that's what follow me is, is will you pour your life out? Will you trust me with your life? Will you pour it out into the things that I say will work? So that led us to today. And today is the culmination of, uh, of all the, the previous weeks where we bring it all together. Uh, we get to learn what it means to be secretly incredible and to be totally awesome and to figure out what God might do with us if we went all in. So check out the video, and I'll be with you in a few minutes. Hey, everybody. How are you? What a day. Gosh, I just uh, was standing off to the side and listening to a person that takes care of hearts for a living, and it makes me want to be like him. Aren't you like that? You meet people that are compelling, and I say, just want to beat like them. Uh, you guys know the movie, The Incredibles, don't you? It's the, you know, there's this big guy that's working at an insurance company, and it's really not him. He knows he's a superhero down deep. But so he keeps doodling these pictures, you know, he's making uniforms and all of them have capes, remember? They all, and then who does he meet? He goes to the person that's gonna make the uh, uniform for him. Who's that gal? She's about four foot nothing tall. Yes, Edna. Edna's the person, and remember what she keeps saying to him? She keeps saying this, no capes. That's her message to him over and over again, just no capes. I wanted to do what you wanna do, which is to make a difference. And a lot of the organizations that I went to to say, hey, can I go do what you're doing? They all said no. They said I could send you money, but, but in terms of actually getting some skin in the game, I keep getting a bunch of no's. And I, I just started thinking to myself, maybe we could do something, not based on status or position or title, but because, as Michael was saying, because of our heart. Maybe we could do it without spin, too. No bracelets. No mission statements, no nothing. If you want a mission statement, I think this would be it. I'd write on my undershirt, be awesome. That would be the mission statement. I wouldn't make a hoodie out of it. I think I'd say, just go be awesome. Because every single outfit that I went to, and they're amazing outfits, that's why I went to them. And I'd say, hey, listen, I own a law firm. I've got a bunch of smart people. We'll do all your stuff for nothing. And they all said no. I'm like, are you kidding me? All work for nothing. <laughs> so it wasn't like they couldn't afford me. So have you guys run into that? So here's what I thought. I thought of this model that Jesus had. Remember, he like cured a couple people. And he said, tell no one. There's a little girl he raised from the dead. And he says, tell no one. Two guys get leprosy and he does his Jedi, whatever that is. They don't have it anymore and he's got one instruction for him: tell no one. And I love that. That's where this idea of being secretly incredible comes from. This idea that we could be just ordinary folks with all of our flaws, all of our scripts, all the stuff that makes us us, but we don't need an organization and a hoodie to do it. We could just be us. And they could stream out of a series of inexplicable no's. Because to be inexplicable, one of these outfits was spending $800,000 a year on lawyers. Said, you can have all mine for nothing. And inexplicably, they said, no. Now, I don't hear God's audible voice. I don't see cloud formations that look like Jesus or John the Baptist. But I think God instead speaks to me through people like you. I think that sometimes, you know, when something pings you, like you hear a heart surgeon. Even something you like laughing. I didn't know my heart started beating after 20 days. Those kinds of things make me think. It's not about status or title. It's about this thing that's going on inside. And to prove it, we did this. When my kids were seven, nine, and 11, that's when the plane hit the building. We don't have a television in the house because I want the kids to hear from dad. If the president gets a girlfriend or if a plane hits a building, I want them to hear from me. So we have a table in our living room and I sat down and I said, hey kids, this horrible thing happened. What would you do 
If you had five minutes in front of a world leader and to make sense out of your faith, your hopes, you know, what you're looking forward to in the future. And I did that dorky dad thing, I made him write it down. So Adam was the first to go and he was seven. And he said, if I had five minutes in front of a world leader, I'd ask him over for a sleepover. And that's because we'd be big buddies afterwards. You know what it's like when you're a kid and you have a sleepover. So he wrote that down. And Richard said, I would ask him this, what is your hope in? I thought that was pretty poignant for a nine-year-old because if I found out what they were hoping in, maybe I was hoping for the same thing. Lindsay was our precocious one and she said, I'd get all this camera gear you got here. I would take my little camera and I'd say, if you can't come over for an interview or rather for a sleepover with us, can we come over to your house and interview you? and ask you what your hope is in. And then we'll pass that message of hope onto another leader. Does that sound like a great idea from an 11 year old? Awesome, so game on, we downloaded the CIA website. You can do that, I felt like I was hacking into NORAD. You could get <laughs> the names of every leader in the whole world. And I made a deal with the kids, we'll send your letter to them, every single leader, and if you get one yes, I'll take you. So the kids wrote this letter, said, you know, dear Gaddafi, uh, <laughs> we're Lindsay Richard and Adam Goff, and uh, we live in San Diego, and we'd like to know if you'd like to come over for a sleepover. And if you can't make it, could we come over to your house and ask you what your hope is in? So we sent all these letters, and I got a post office box because I didn't want Gaddafi to know where I lived. <laughs> so we, every day after school, we got all these letters back, and they all said the same thing. It would be like from Tony Blair. It would say, jolly good show, like forget it, but jolly good show. <laughs> We got it from all these countries, and some of them, I didn't even know where the country was. I just said, they'd say, like, Dad, where's this? I goes, like, east. <laughs> but one day, I heard all the squealing from the back seat of the car, and they got a letter from the leader of Bulgaria. And he said, kids, if you'll come to the palace, I'll give you your interview. And they were like, ah! <laughs> and then the prime minister of Switzerland said, kids, if you'll come to Bern, I'll give you your interview. And then the president of Israel said, kids, to come to Jerusalem, we got 29 yeses. Do <laughs> you believe that? So, the, so we like, pulled the kids out of school, their teachers had a cow, I'm like, sue me. So <laughs> away we went. But the whole idea isn't prompted by status and kind of like that th thing Jesus was saying to people, just be secretly incredible. It's like what's happening in your heart. It's what you just heard from this fantastic doctor before. And it isn't driven. Now, I'm speaking to a group, a room, and two rooms down below full of really able people. But it's not what you're able to do. Because you guys are able to do tons. If I said, think, let's make a rocket ship, three people would raise their hands and say, I just have the parts on me. <laughs> but here's the deal. I want to find, and don't you, what we were made to do. And if you operate under the handicap operate, I operate with, which is I don't hear God's audible voice. So I say instead, what pings me? What lights me up? So on one of these trips, we ended up in Uganda. And I started thinking, shoot, I'm a, a lawyer. Maybe we could help out with these justice issues. The average age for the country was 14 and a half years old. Can you believe that? 14 and a half years, it's a nation of children. So we went to the jails and we found these young men and women that would be put in jail and four years later, they'd still be sitting in jail, never having stepped foot in a court. If I don't want your son to hang out with my daughter, I just accuse him of defilement and he goes to jail that day. Four years later, he's still sitting there. So I said, ask some judges who were then friends. I said, why don't we try some of these cases? So they said, okay. So I bought the entire Ugandan law library, both books. And we started, we just started trying cases. That's that idea that it's not driven by status or position or title. It isn't because you were cool enough to join the right organizations because all the right organizations that are that cool are too smart to have me. And maybe they're too smart to have you. But maybe what we do instead, that idea of like, take it from Edna, no capes. What if we just do secretly incredible stuff? So we tried these cases against kids, and we tried about 250 cases in total, but 80 of these were involved with kids sitting in jail for two, three, four years at a time. And out of those 80 cases, we dropped 79 kids off at home. All charges resolved. Doesn't that sound like the kind of thing, I don't wanna make a wristband out of that. I just wanna go do awesome stuff. Don't you wanna like be awesome? That's our mission statement, isn't it? And if we all decided to do that, we could make rocket ships. We could do all this really unlikely stuff. 
There's this horrible practice in Uganda uh, of child sacrifice. It's not given a lot of attention, but it's just a horrible thing. There's uh, many witch doctors. And up until a few years ago, there was no law outlawing trafficking in people or trafficking in body parts. We started going into these jail cells, finding kids, not only the ones that had been accused of crimes, but also finding the perpetrators and saying, who are these bad guys that are taking body parts from kids? And there were always a victim, but the problem is the victim was always left for dead. So we had nothing to do. And then there was also an intimidation factor by the judges. They didn't want to try a case against a powerful witch doctor because of some consequences to them. But we found a scrappy judge. And we said, let's go try this case. Let's roll out this law that's been on the books for three or four years, but never has been tried uh, involving the trafficking of body parts and prohibiting it. So we found this little boy. His name was, we'll just call him Charlie. Charlie had been abducted. He was eight years old. Uh, he had these parts cut off of him and was left for dead by a witch doctor named Kabi. Uh, we tried that case. I'm sitting in a hut across from the courthouse with all my stuff piled up against the door. And the judge has three guys with machine guns around his house. Because there was a lot of, like, when you start doing stuff without capes individually, then there was just a lot of stuff that you set in motion. But that judge tried the case and the conviction came back, the first conviction in East Africa. And it wasn't about an organization. It wasn't about status or title. It was about a secretly incredible kid. And I think, while I don't see God's face in bushes and cloud formations, while I don't hear an audible voice, I think someday God's gonna touch us on the nose to say, you were secretly incredible with what you did. And it won't be because of us, it'll be because of kids like Charlie. It'll be like no-name kids from San Diego that say audaciously to leaders, what we want to do is not meet with you to advance an agenda or tell you stop doing this or do more of that. Instead, what if we do this novel concept of just being friends? but not the bastardized version of friendship, which is networking. Let's just be friends, because we're friends. There's nothing on the other side of the equal sign. And I think that's what uh, we have a room full of. It's just a bunch of people that want to say, yes, let's go be secretly incredible. And I applaud you for that. Thank you very much. God bless you guys. Isn't that cool? So, um, so what I want you to do is I want you to ask two questions and have that little form in front of you and uh, take a moment to fill it out if you haven't already. Some of you maybe got a head start. And it's just these two simple questions. How might you be secretly incredible? What do you think God's leading you to do? And I'm going to ask you to bring it forward and tape it onto one of these balloons. And in addition to that, how might Crosswalk be secretly incredible? I know this sounds a little counterintuitive, like, hey, we should be shouting it from mountaintops, but maybe not. You know, a lot of what we do here, when people hear about what we do, food ministries and all that, they're like, no way. And we're like, yeah, way. Uh, because it's about serving the people. Uh, it's about doing the right thing. It's about being secretly incredible, even as a church. And so I'm asking you to dream a little bit, pray a little bit, fill the thing out. And uh, you can at any time, starting uh, as soon as the video starts, uh, just come on forward. I'll lower these things down a little bit so that you can grab them. Just tape down there and just tape them up. Then what's going to happen is I'm going to take them all down and uh, I'm going to take them to our board of stewards and say, look, uh, our church prayed about this, uh, how, we, how, we, how we might be incredible. And uh, let's see what kind of themes emerge and see what we think God might be leading us toward as a church. So you have a voice into the future uh, with this thing about who we might become. And I hope you take it seriously. All right, and if you happen to have a complex idea and you're willing to talk a little bit more about it, put your name or address on it so we can follow up with you uh, if we need to. You understand what's going on? That's a collective yes, yes. Okay, good. All right, get to work. There's a video called Love Does, and at the end of it, I'll do a little prayer thing with you.